I'm Andre J, and today I'd like to talk to you about analog and digital signals, the myth and magic and mythology and uh, science and mathematics of these topics. <laughs> and uh, uh, just generally speaking, try to talk about the, 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 the intersection of the sort of inherent uh, uh, signal processing slash computing qualities of these kinds of signals and how we can use them in glitch art and other forms of uh, uh, creative signal-based art forms to, to, to use them in a more intentional manner. Um, <clears throat> as promised, uh, we would discuss sort of mythologies and then kind of try to dispel some of the old mythologies and probably create some new mythologies in the process. Um, but yeah, so let's just start off with the big, if you've been on a message board for synthesizers in the last 20 years, <laughs> then you may have noticed that there is sort of this general um, idea that people have about analog versus digital where Analog is warm and alive and just sort of has some sort of like intangible like oomph to it that makes it superior to digital. Um, and I'm going to sort of, when we talk about these things, when I describe them further, we're going to understand that there is like, it's not complete bullshit, like why people feel that way. Uh, but to a large extent, it is uh, 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 like it's based on some facts. But the, 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 the actual, like, like inherent, like, the, the, there's nothing really super inherent about analog or digital itself that, is meant, that made people feel that way. This is more of just sort of an implementation uh, 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 situation and a marketing, a lot of marketing techniques that have sort of given people these impressions. And uh, uh, by the end of this talk, we should have a better idea of why people felt that way to begin with once and why it's kind of complete nonsense at this point in time. Uh, but just to start off, we're going to talk about just what does analog mean and what does digital mean. So from the, the engineering perspective, from a signal processing slash computing perspective, analog simply means continuous, like a continuously varying, uh, 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 continuously varying over time uh, uh, variable. And uh, uh, just digital just means discrete, as in it's sort of there's, there's just like integer valued numbers or something. So, for example, uh, uh, clocks would be like the oldest form of like signal processing slash computing. I'm going to be using sort of signal processing and computing to, to refer to very similar things here because from my perspective, signal processing and computing are both sort of different sides of the same basic concept. Uh, they're, they're two fundamentally different ways of looking at it, but the process is sort of the same if that makes sense. Like in signal processing, we're more concerned with what's going on at every step of the way at like a low level, like what is happening to the signal. And then on computing, our, uh, uh, we're more preoccupied with like what is the outcome and what is the algorithm by which we uh, uh, find this outcome. But they're both kind of talking about the same thing. So signal processing and computing, more or less same basic concept, but two very different ways of looking at it. <clears throat> but so historically speaking, the oldest kind of signal processing slash computing devices that humans have would be clocks, uh, because it's always important to be able to tell time. And the oldest kind of, uh, 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 think about what are some of the oldest continuous, the, the oldest analog clocks we have, that would be like a water clock, where you just have like a continually like dripping source of water, and then basically based upon these different kinds of basins and levers that are like being triggered by certain weights, you're, uh, one is able to kind of take uh, 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 the continuous drips of water and transform that into a way to like chop up your day into like a bunch of hours, seconds, or minutes um, by the good old fashioned Babylonian sexagismal uh, base 60 counting system, which we still use, still don't have metric time yet. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh yeah, metric, that's that's the way to go, everything, except for time. We're not going to do metric time. For some reason, that one just never really caught on. 
you know, I'm also not personally like, like, I know this is going out to Europeans, so people might feel kind of strongly about this, but I personally feel like the metric system is a little bit overrated in the grand scheme of things. Like, base 10 is just as arbitrary as any other base. There's a reason people chose base 12 and base 60 for various things, is because you can mentally, like, calculate things that are like uh, divisors or multiples of 12 and 60 pretty easily. And it's not quite actually as easy to do that with base 10. Base 10, it's quite easier. As long as you're writing things down in a base 10 decimal notation, then it's like, it makes things a lot easier. But if you're just like trying to like think about things on the fly, if you're like an architect, a surveyor, or someone just like doing things with counting on like uh, 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 notches and stuff, like trying to do mental computing, actually base 12 makes a lot more sense. Uh, Anyway, metric time, not going to have them. Uh, <laughs> the oldest kind of uh, digital clocks that people had would be like um, the kind of uh, like an hourglass because there's a discrete number of sand grains of like individual pieces of sand in your uh, hourglass and they kind of fall down like more or less like one at a time and you just kind of like, oh, here's an hour, clunk, turn it over and here's another hour. It's sort of, if you wanted to be pathological enough about it, you could sit and like stare at it and count each individual point of like, like, like grain of sand as it drops and be like, that's another millisecond or something. So hourglass is a digital computer. And uh, uh, by computing, I mean it just computes time. It computes divisions of time for you. It's solving the problem of how many hours have passed since I last did this one thing. <coughs> Um, so, continuous and discrete, analog and digital. Uh, of course, we don't really use water clocks anymore. Like, that, that analog computing sort of, and analog pro signal processing has, has sort of, like, come a long way. Uh, 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 at least, like, like, to the point where now we don't think of the idea of analog computing whatsoever. Uh, uh, the idea of a computer being an entirely digital thing, probably around the 70s was when people stopped putting digital computer in front of the word computer, and when people were just like, yeah, it's just all digital computers are, all computers are digital computers. But before that, there was a long history of mechanical analog computers, like you used basically clockwork, you used gears uh, that were driven by springs um, or driven by water to do things, so like these giant sort of cathedral clocks that you had, uh, there, were, there were cathedral clocks that could do things like calculate the date of Easter every year that were from like the 16th or 17th century, these massively complicated things that had like like hundreds and hundreds of different gears of varying like things that, that uh, could, could calculate these very minuscule and like obscure kind of like date-based things. Uh, even going back all the way to like ancient Greece, like, you know, 2000 plus years ago, there was a, a device called the Antikytheria mechanism, which was like a handheld clockwork device that worked as basically like a clockwork planetarium. Um, it could, um, it would tell you when the Olympics would occur every year, it would tell you when like your lunar eclipses the, or solar eclipses would occur, occur and lunar eclipses. Uh, it was this massively complicated little handheld version of what uh, uh, ended up like being more sort of uh, uh, a cathedral clock. Uh, and the cathedral clock uh, design was actually originated more so in, uh, uh, I think, the, the, the Middle East. Um, probably based off of Greek designs uh, from, from various sacks and conquests of the, the, the Byzantine <laughs> areas of that time. But the first large-scale cathedral clocks that we take for granted as being like Western European things were, were Islamic in design to begin with. Um, but yeah, so Greeks had a very... They, they had a lot of interesting ideas on mathematics, philosophy, the world. They didn't really think about computing as explicitly as we do these days. But if you think back to like uh, 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 some like uh, like the, this, this is common paradox, the Zeno paradoxes, which are all sort of like if I want to walk across the room, I first have to walk halfway across the room, and then I have to walk halfway the distance of halfway across the room, and then I have to walk half of that distance. Uh, so I can't ever walk across the room. 
Uh, this is fundamentally a paradox. The, the point that they're trying to make is not one that you can't possibly move. Like, because of course I can walk across the room right now. I'm not going to do that because that would be a sort of absurd physical humor joke to throw in here, but it's obviously possible. The point they're trying to make is that distance in the world as we perceive it seems to be infinitely, you can chop it up into uh, uh, sort of arbitrarily, infinitely small amounts. <laughs> And this is kind of what we mean by, like, continuous variable. It means that there's no limit to how far down we can chop things up. And we can't, like, when we have discrete things, you can't really do that. Like, like in terms of if I'm a shepherd, I, the number of sheep that I have, functionally for me, as the concept of being a shepherd, is completely discrete. Like, I don't care about one-third of a sheep. That's not worth anything to me. I want my sheep to be alive. I need them to all be integer numbers. Like, there's no value to, like, <laughs> this kind of, like, uh, chopping up into continuous values of this concept. Uh, and then the other sort of, like, famous Greek who had ideas about continuous and discrete was Democritus. And Democritus was the sort of countered Zeno with this idea of, like, Reality is not a continuum. Reality is composed of tiny atoms. Like, go, there's there's a limit. You know, how far down you go, somewhere you're going to get to, like, this, this sort of, like, fundamental unit of something. So 2,000 years ago, before any quantum physicists were around, there was someone who just sort of thought it's completely reasonable to assume that there's something discrete at the heart of it. <laughs> Pardon me. So then if we hop on forward into, like, Newtonian, Galilean, Keplerian era, uh, this is where these ideas of con the, the continuum, which had kind of remained, like, stagnant in, like, the Western world up to that point, sort of started being more, like, examined more thoroughly. And this was due to something called the calculus. Some people, depending on how intelligent you want to sound, you say the calculus. Otherwise, I think most people just say calculus. <laughs> but if you want to sort of impress someone that the calculus is sort of this interesting idea that we want to examine, then you toss that definer. And I do want to sort of emphasize, I'll, I'll be obnoxious and pretentious for a moment and say, the calculus. The calculus is fundamentally about thinking about the world as a continuum. And you think about time and space, both as being continuous. And the reason that you have to sort of assume that there's a continuum happening here is because what happens in calculus is, without going into too many details, is you assume that you can do, you can add up an infinite number of things that are divided by an infinitely, by like a, an arbitrarily infinitely small amount of things. So fundamental sort of hidden in this idea of calculus and neither Leibniz nor Newton really explicitly addressed to the issue at the time. They just did it and it worked. So sort of hidden under there was this idea that you could basically uh, divide reality, divide space and time up into arbitrarily small chunks. So atoms are out. Um, there is no discrete time. There is no discrete reality. There is no discrete anything. There's arbitrarily small. No matter how small you get, you can always find another smaller thing to chop off. Uh, most people were pretty okay with this because it worked really, really well, and governments at the time were pretty psyched on the fact that you could actually pay some nerd in a church, like a church college, to like uh, uh, write down a bunch of things and then make it so that their canons could go farther and do more damage than someone else's canons. So. Calculus and ballistics are fundamentally linked. If, you, if the people didn't want to blow each other up as hard as they did back then, uh, we might not have had such a strong development of calculus. The other thing that calculus was relevant to was for horoscopes, because everyone at the time in Western Europe uh, believed quite devoutly in astrology, and it was very important to have your horoscope like read and reread and continually updated by mathematicians. So many mathematicians made money by just hanging out around uh, uh, wealthy landowners and 
uh, reading their horoscopes. And it's, you know, you don't really know how they may have felt about that at the time. <laughs> but, you know, they were probably just like, that's a living. Um, but the thing about calculus is, even in the modern day, like, like we've sort of, mathematicians have sort of, like, addressed these issues of, like, uh, continuum versus discrete. And we got to this point where we sort of have to, like, <clears throat> take a step back, look at calculus, and look at these ideas and say, can we divide something infinitely small? Like, in operation, in the real world, if we want to add up a series of numbers, we need this to be a finite number of numbers. Uh, otherwise, we can't actually add this up. And calculus seems to be a shorthand for skipping the fact, we're sort of like hand-waving over the fact that we're doing an infinite sum. Uh, but so for most situations where we need to solve differential equations in the real world, like ever, uh, you don't actually get to use pure calculus methods to do so. You use some calculus to sort of give you a nice set of heuristics, and then you have to sort of turn it into a discrete problem, pick an arbitrary limit on what you're actually going to be adding up in terms of time and space, and then turn it into a digital problem. Uh, so this has sort of been inherent in, in the sort of theory, the mathematical theory of calculus and the applied engineering aspect of calculus ever since it first uh, originated is that it seems like it's a very analog thing and the analog thing has a very sort of strong heuristic like predictive component to it. Anytime you actually need to do something with it, you probably are going to have to turn it into a digital problem. Um, and yeah, and then hand wave, let's skip over a bunch of things, and uh, 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 we're going to talk more about classical versus statistical versus quantum physics, but let's just jump to quantum physics. Currently, the, the, the predominantly popular idea in terms of how do we think about the universe is that the universe is, seems to be mostly digital, it seems to be mostly discrete. Um, at, at, as we go down, Maybe it seems everything that we know of except for gravity is discrete. And that's sort of the interesting question there. Is, is gravity discrete or is gravity continuous? No one knows because gravity does not seem to fit into quantum mechanics. That's all. Quantum mechanics is fundamentally about digital reality. Um, so it sort of seems as though quantum mechanics makes calculus obsolete. Uh, it doesn't really, um, because like like classical physics is like a heuristic, and as we said, when we apply these things, when we actually need to solve something in the real world, we have to chop them up and turn them into discrete problems. Uh, but yeah, so that more or less sums up the first chunk of what I want to talk about. And next, I want to talk about how do analog and digital signals work, and sort of delve into a little bit of how we use them in glitch art. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about analog digital signals and glitch art. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'm going to ignore sort of any sort of concept of glitch aesthetic or glitch, the, the, the more sort of critical theory uh, approach to what defining what glitch art is, and just say glitch art seems to me, from the perspective of what I'm talking about here, be primarily about we have some sort of a signal which we have encoded. And by encoded, I mean we're not doing some sort of direct representation of it. And then we're going to deliberately misinterpret uh, that code and then decode it. What I mean by that is let's talk about analog uh, audio signals for a moment. So if I have an analog audio signal, and let's say I'm talking to you on a telephone as of 1945 or something. So if I'm talking to you on a telephone in 1945, what happens is I'm speaking into a receiver which has a little thing which vibrates because my sound is making pressure waves in the atmosphere and it makes this little uh, transducer thing vibrate, and by vibrating, it generates an electrical signal. And as the electrical signal varies in time, the, the amplitude, the voltage of this electrical signal varies continuously as my voice varies. <clears throat> so this is an analog signal. Uh, because it is an analogy to how it is actually happening in the physical world. Um, 
So if you think about it, this is not really encoded uh, uh, in, in the strict sense of the term. This is an uncompressed signal. Uh, uh, compression, eh, kind of, sort of, there's a lot of ways we can encode things in an uncompressed way nowadays. Uh, let's pretend that doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, so, in, in terms of having an uncompressed audio signal, there weren't really any ways you could glitch it, like in the way I'm talking about, but you could distort it. Uh, the two fundamental ways being literally just blowing it out with saturation or distortion or by interference with noise. Uh, these were huge issues, and these two issues in telephone signals were why we have the, um, the why we have digital signal processing to begin with. Because digital signals, uh, for um, for all intents and purposes, are impervious to the, the kind of noise and distortion issues that uh, analog signals have. But yeah, so that sort of direct analog, unencoded analog signal isn't really glitchable. However, on the other hand, let's think that it's 1945, and I am talking to you on an AM handheld radio, like, like or CB or, sh or shortwave or some kind of radio technique. Um, this is a signal which can be glitched, uh, because these radio signals were encoded specifically encoded uh, in, in that you needed to figure out a way to transform uh, pressure waves into voltage. And you needed to transform that voltage into uh, uh, the voltage continuously varying waves into continually varying high frequency photon waves in order to transmit them through the atmosphere. Uh, so the encoding techniques available at the time were AM, amplitude modulation, or FM, frequency modulation. Uh, these are both concepts very familiar to people who work in uh, uh, synthesis because they're also very interesting ways to generate harmonics and uh, 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 interesting sounds out of very simple sounds. <clears throat> but their origins are purely from the radio uh, so this is a way that you could encode an analog signal <clears throat> in order to transmit it uh, better. Uh, the fun thing happens, and you can actually try this out right now if you like want to, is you can take a radio signal and decode it using a different technique. There's actually a handful more of ways to encode and decode than just AM and FM. They're all sort of based off of uh, uh, fundamentally amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. But if you Google Web SDR, SDR standing for Software Defined Radios, uh, you'll find some really interesting websites where you can access very large antennas uh, which can grab a very, very wide spectrum of radio signals and then choose different de demodulation. We call them demodulation instead of decoding for radio. <clears throat> choose different demodulation techniques to grab and decode these radio signals in ways that they were not intended to. So this is, uh, I think, one of the fundamentally most interesting and fun ways to do sort of pure analog glitch art is by sort of exploiting the vast world of the electromagnetic uh, communication spectrum and just by sort of uh, 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 using it to, to grab these crazy textures and these crazy textures are just everywhere. Uh, you could also just grab a shortwave radio and especially if you live near a busy harbor or any kind of like large industrial areas, just walk around with a shortwave radio sometime and some headphones on and just start dialing around at different frequencies and see what kind of pops up. Because there's a lot of uh, electromagnetic uh, information out there in the world. And uh, uh, I, I've sort of used a lot of that in musical things that I've done, and a lot of interesting uh, audiovisual artists have done the same. <clears throat> But that's about as much as we can talk about analog glitch in this sort of concept. Uh, the, the, the sort of interesting thing that we have to work with here is that analog signals don't really care that much. The, the, the way that we encode and decode analog signals is sort of brute forced circuitry based. Um, even in the web SDR thing, uh, uh, it's sort of based off of this brute force circuit-based encoding and decoding. So whatever you feed it in, 
and my lighting seems to want to be unstable today. There's a glitch right there. Um, so whatever you sort of feed into it, uh, you get to decode it. Uh, and we can see this in another sort of interesting, maybe analog, we'll find out that it's not actually, uh, signal when we talk about analog video. So analog video, and uh, uh, by that I mean CBBS, composite video broadcast standard, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the United States we had something called MTSC, in uh, Europe and most of the rest of the world we had PAL or CCAM. Uh, we can sort of fundamentally think about these as being the same kind of encoding. Um, the main difference between the, the, the two was that slightly different frame rates, slightly different versions of color modulation, but otherwise the basic encoding structure was similar. Actually, PAL uh, had a sort of interesting signal-based way to uh, do error correction on the fly, <coughs> which was pretty interesting. PAL stands for phase alternating line, and you use sort of this alternating phase for each line to correct errors, whereas NTSC uh, sort of just said, we're going to have color errors. Uh, this is built into the system, but what we'll do is make it so everyone on their TV sets can have a little knob called phase, and you turn it one way or the other, and that will sort of bring things back into uh, uh, a better structure. <laughs> but yeah, so analog video, much like the radio signals, uh, CVBS, the, the analog video standards were designed so that you could take all of the information in video and transmit it, turn it from, uh, instead of pressure waves, turn it from photons and pressure waves. Let's ignore the audio part of it for now. You wanted to take photons, turn them into voltage, turn that voltage back into uh, a, uh, a different set of photons. So the original photons were light photons, and those were at a very, 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 very high frequency. And we needed to <clears throat> downsample them into some much lower frequency voltage, continually varying voltages, and then transform those low frequency, continuously varying very voltages into some slight, some higher frequency varying photons that were not as high frequency as the original photons, transmit them over radio, and then do a reverse demodulation, de-encoding thing so that you can have something everyone can watch. <coughs> Excuse me, the same episode of Seinfeld. But we call this analog video, and most people who practice video art and, and get deep into the signal side of things are like, yeah, it's analog video. Uh, it's an RCA signal here, an RCA thing here, like it's totally analog. Uh, but by our definitions of analog and digital, analog video is not actually a pure analog signal. Uh, it is, by definition, a hybrid digital analog signal. What do I mean by that? I mean, in terms of how the signal is actually like uh, uh, encoded, uh, first off, it's digital with respect to time. There is a discrete sample of time. There's only 60 fields per second, and I don't want to get into fields versus frames, so if you want to know more about it, Google those things, um, and I will never mention fields again. So 60 frames per second, or 50 if you're in PAL or CCAM, um, <clears throat> means that you have only this fixed number of time samples for your video. So it's 100% digital as far as time is concerned. And then for each frame, let's ignore time for a second and just talk about one single frame of uh, analog video and realize that what we're talking about is for each line. So on an analog video display, there are a fixed number of phosphors on the output, and there's also a fixed number of lines. So going from here to over here, if I could, I'm really bad, going from there, the left hand side. Thanks. <laughs> um, from here to here, we do have a pure analog signal right there, and it's continually varying voltage, photons, whatever have you information. Uh, but as soon as we hit here, 
this side of things, but you have to stop and come back all the way over, let the camera refocus a second, and start another continuously varying line. So even in terms of one single frame of analog video, we're still dealing with the fact that we're discrete. We're working in discrete steps from top to bottom. It's a fixed number, 480 visible lines for NTSC and 576 for Pattern C cam. So it's, uh, 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 it's, it's a hybrid analog digital system, which means that you can do uh, some more sort of complex and crazy kind of glitches with things. The most obvious one of these that people uh, uh, find out about once you start tinkering around with video is you have a digital signal that tells you when a new frame begins, which is a pulse, and you have another digital signal which tells you when a new line begins, which is also a pulse, the canonical digital signal, just one little square wave at a fixed frequency. Uh, and if you mess around with these, if you do anything to the signal which messes around with the sync, you're going to get waving lines and everything is going to kind of come in and out and fold over and maybe one frame will interfere with another frame. Uh, you can design a dirty mixer very cheap and use two video signals together to see how messing around with the digital part of the, the, the video signals gives you some really beautiful smooth things. And the reason it sort of ends up working really well on some monitors and absolutely garbage on other monitors has to do with this fact that we were talking about earlier is that if you have a pure analog signal demodulation or decoding line, which a lot of old CRTs have, it doesn't care how bad of a signal you feed into it. It's just going to do whatever it wants, whatever it thinks it's supposed to do with the information it's being given. And if you have an LCD TV and you try to feed it this kind of information, it's going to be digitally sampling that. And as it digitally samples it, it's going to kind of check and see, is this a legit signal? And if it's not a legit signal, a lot of times it's just going to give you the blue, the, 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 the blue I give up shrug symbol. <laughs> Same thing for a lot of projectors too. This is a common issue with glitch video artists is that um, if you don't have a pure analog uh, demodulation uh, uh, set up, it's just going to be like, I don't like this. I don't care to even try to work with this. And if you have a pure analog uh, uh, demodulation set up, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> Another thing you can find out that sort of uh, uh, exploits the same thing is if you feed an audio signal into the back of an old CRT. Uh, most of the time, what you're going to see on the older stuff is it's just going to like grab that audio signal and just kind of be like, well, I think this is what you want me to do with it, and just show you a bunch of wavy lines. So the audio signal isn't really giving you the correct information to display like an actual image, but it is giving you voltage. It's giving you some kind of an information. It's just like, well, you gave me voltage, and I'll give you what I think you're trying to like <coughs> tell me, but... Who knows? Apologies for my scratchy voice. I have allergy issues. And I usually don't talk this much in one day. But yeah, the other interesting thing that we can do, which is sort of similar to how the radio signal thing was working, is with analog video, no matter which standard you're using, they had to take color information and figure out a way how to get color modulated onto the, the, the Luma information. So all analog video was backwards compatible with black and white uh, signals. And the way they did that was kind of uh, very aesthetically pleasing from an engineering standpoint where you turned your color information into really high frequency inf varying information, you use quadrature amplitude modulation to kind of pull uh, uh, information about uh, various differences in blue or red or cyan or YUV or YQ, whichever one you're working with, <clears throat> and take a three-dimensional uh, 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 signal and turn it into a one-dimensional signal with the sort of caveat that it's it adds another level of instability and uh, what you can do with it. So if you play with more complex kind of glitch modulation things where you like or not even complex, just look at like a bit effector. A bit effector is probably about the simplest video glitch device I can think of. And what it kind of does is just grab a video signal in, uh, use comparators to sort of like chop up at any given point in time. It's sort of chopping up your video signal into these discrete steps and then grabbing the discrete steps and adding it back into the original signal. So you have this sort of like chunky 
um, kind of ringing like uh, overdrive happening on it. What happens is, so if you work with just like a black and white signal and you did that, what you would end up getting is actually kind of just this kind of posterization distortion on everything. Posterization meaning you just quantized each sort of gradient level and left it sort of flat-ish. Not quite because we still have the original signal involved, but more or less. Uh, but because color is modulated using another encoding technique into the Luma, what happens if you just take that encoded color information, distort it, and then add it back to itself, means you get these kind of unpredictable sort of crazy colors going on. And I've seen this personally when I've built and tested out the effectors. You get crazy colors that you usually never see in, uh, or which I have usually never seen in NTSC unless you're using some sort of crazy high frequency oscillators to like mess with things like neon colors and like bright yellows and pinks and stuff like that. So that's sort of uh, a very simple way you could personally work with using analog glitch techniques on, on video. Using actually what is pretty fundamentally a <laughs> discrete digital thing to like mess around with it because comparator which splits things up into different levels is uh turning an analog signal into a discrete signal so you, do you kind of see maybe you see what i mean right around this point about how analog and digital there's not really anything super important like integrally about like these things for quality things but it's very interesting and good to understand like what are what's going on with analog and digital in terms of how can we like use things intentionally and interestingly or even like have intentional ways to uh, sort of destroy things in interesting ways and finally if we want to talk about digital glitch techniques um, we kind of run into this issue of digital glitches are hard to work with in a real-time map. Uh, and this is because uh, a lot of digital um, encoding techniques for video and for audio rely on uh, compression not just in space, but in time. Time on a linear map. And the sort of canonical video glitch that people get into is this data moshing thing, which uses keyframes to kind of like uh, create bizarre effects. This is about time compression. And what I mean by time compression is so if you look in this video and imagine that I haven't done anything to change this video, which I'm going to do, and you look at my forehead and just like. If you look at every single frame of this video and just look right here at this point in my forehead, I'm not moving my head that much, and even when I move my head, it's still basically going to be part of my forehead right there. So there's no reason that we actually need to have one pixel that says, this is Andre's forehead color for every single one of the uh, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of frames in this video. Um, well, instead, we can just use this sort of keyframe idea and say, the first time we have this frame, let's save this information for the color of my forehead, and then let's just check and see as we encode things if we need to change that. If we don't, then we're just going to have this sort of information that says, just use the information from the last one. And because I'm not going to change my head that much, except for right now, up until that point, there has been no update for that sort of keyframe information for like what's going on there. So what keyframes and time compression is about is how much difference is there in between your frames. And if there's no difference between your frames, let's throw that information out for each frame and just use reuse the same old information. Uh, but the problem with this thing, that this has been is that you can't really do this sort of real-time like uh, data moshing thing. I mean, there's probably like computer vision sort of ways that you can do it. But from like the, 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 the data moshing, like, like the people who understand how to work with it in terms of keyframes, it's primarily a, uh, uh, you do it in advance and then you see how it works out. And the same thing kind of works for audio compression too, because there's audio compression techniques that work in sort of time compression and it gets like unpacked in real time. Um, but you do kind of have to have this sort of like, you, you have to have the whole thing established first. So if you want to do MP3 glitching, open it up in like WordPad or open it up as like a visual like raw file and mess around with the bitmaps and turn it back. This is sort of, uh, uh, you, you lose this ability to do real time stuff. And the other problem with digital glitching, which is integral to digital techniques, is that you kind of, um, you have to 
you can't mess it up too hard. It's, you, you, when you decode things, you need much more information to decode your digital signals because the sheer number of, for any given kind of like, whether it's audio, uh, image, or video, the sheer number of different encoding techniques for all of those and the sheer number of ways that like any sort of decoder has to be able to understand like a large number of all of these things like VLC, you want to make sure that it can understand AVI, uh, DIV, XVID, M uh, uh, H.264, uh, uh, MTS, like motion JPEG 3, like it needs to understand all of these various different kinds of decoding techniques. And if you feed it something that you glitch so much that it doesn't know what how to decode it, it's just gonna say, I don't care. I'm not gonna do anything with this. No thank you. So you have sort of the 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 the, the strength of digital is that you have like a lot more sort of like you can micromanage everything to a tiny degree in a way that you can't really do with analog signals because you have this kind of uh, 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 way to bypass time. Uh, but you sort of, in a way, you have to bypass the time. <clears throat> you can't do it in real time. And if you go too hard, you don't have anything to work with at the end of it. And finally, let's come back around to why do we have these sort of prejudices about analog and digital signals for creative purposes, and uh, why do why is why do why do we seem to think that the world is analog when it seems to be digital? And uh, I wanted to talk more about perception um, and analog versus digital perception, but it didn't seem to fit in with the time here. Uh, but Long story short, human perception seems to be a mixture of analog and digital techniques. Um, <clears throat> but the way that we perceive things and interact with reality is that we basically, for, for our sensory, from our nervous system's perspective, time is a continuum and space is a continuum. So even though quantum physics tells us that space does not seem to be continuous, and neither does time, uh, 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 well, it doesn't really tell us that. That's a joke. <laughs> it tells us that fundamental units of reality, uh, fundamental particles, are continuous, and time are, are not continuous, and time might not be continuous. We can't really jump to that conclusion. Um, but it seems likely. I don't know. The, uh, once you start digging down into quantum physics, you find that no one actually really agrees on interpretations of things, and that the, the the mathematical structure of quantum physics allows you to say basically nothing other than talking about measurements, which is kind of tricky and has become quite a philosophical nightmare slash pleasure house for a lot of folks involved in various fringes. Uh, of science and new age. Um, but from our operational purposes, from our perception systems, from our nervous systems, we live and interact with an analog uh, uh, world. But it seems like it's all digital at a basic certain point. Um, so this is kind of the point I want to make is also if you look, we're all looking on a computer screen right now and hopefully the compression on this is decent enough that it seems like this is a pretty smooth analog like like <clears throat> simulation of things. <clears throat> but if you take like a macro lens or a magnifying glass and zoom in far enough and see that it's <clears throat> all grid based, it's all discrete. So. As far as we're concerned, the difference between analog and digital is more or less like what is the threshold point? Like where, like how far down do you have to go? How how hidden is the discreteness? If the discreteness, if the digital nature of things is hidden at such a level, then it's functionally analog for us. Um, the, the prejudice that people have that is usually synthesizer based about analog versus digital is based on basically 80s technology. In the early 80s, you had analog synthesizers and you had digital synthesizers. Um, and just based on the hardware limitations of the time, analog synthesizers, uh, like remember when I was talking about the sort of distortion and noise the issues in the telephone line? 
analog synthesizers were built to kind of use those as the, the, the inherent distortion and noise of analog signals to like use those as sort of probes. They made it kind of like unstable, wavering, and, and feel like, like the, the, the oscillators felt as though they were kind of alive in a certain way. Analog uh, oscillators also used uh, these sort of infinite feedback loops, like uh, uh, resonant filters are feedback loops, and they're, they're very highly controlled and like stable ways of working with audio feedback to make things feel like very alive in a way too. And the digital synthesizers at the time, while sort of like they, 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 they definitely like had a lot of crows to them, they were simply unable to replicate that kind of uh, uh, behavior in terms of making things feel sort of unstable at a low, unstable below the level of your perception. Because you didn't actually, nobody could like really like listen to the, the oscillator of a prophet and be like, oh, this is unstable in a really pleasing way to me. But they were able to listen to it and be like, I like the way this sounds for some reason. It's really great and it's sort of unstable. Like they're, it's sort of just like not quite like perfect in a very perfect way. Whereas you listen to just like a pure sine wave being generated from something uh, from a digital system and it's completely perfect. Uh, and, and you can sort of like, that, 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 the, the fact that it's too perfect and it doesn't have any instability sort of hidden below your uh, liminality meant that people sort of interpreted this as being like this kind of like cold and distant thing. Uh, this is not a problem for systems anymore. Like, like digital systems are basically like, like there, there is ways to sort of leverage instability and feedback systems in DSP now in real time, which completely bypass all of this. And, um, you know, we really didn't get to talk about analog computers that much, uh, but I did want to kind of point out that like analog computers, totally hot shit for a while, and then completely kind of like fell off into nothing in the 70s or so. Uh, there is one area where analog voltage-based computing is sort of still like alive, and that is um, analog modular synthesizers. But sort of the funny thing about analog modular synthesizers, just two funny things, is that people are usually like, I don't use computers at all, but an analog modular synthesis system is a computing system. The, the other thing is that a lot, a significant amount of analog modular synthesizers are using analog pretty much only for high-speed transmission of information, because that's still where analog is a bit more useful for cheap purposes, is just very fast going from one to another. <clears throat> and a significant amount of Eurorack-based uh, modular synthesis stuff is just grabbing an analog audio or analog uh, control signal and dumping it into like some kind of an FPGA buffer and doing DSP on it and spitting it out because that's just functionally like we are in the era where doing DSP is kind of just makes a lot more sense but if uh, we want to transmit information anywhere we want to be able to use analog mediums to do so. But at a certain point uh, we're working in like with gigabit internet uh, ethernet uh, that, that you could kind of do so much more in terms of high speed, like reliable digital communication that doesn't use 1,000 hash cables everywhere, uh, but it would mean like a slightly more complicated way of like mentally routing things. And this is actually something I'm working on right now in terms of my video synthesis thing. So, yeah, I don't know. That's about all I want really to say about that. But the main thing about analog and digital is that. If it's below, like we can honestly just define analog at this point, throw out this whole sort of continuously varying thing and just say, if it is far beyond our perception system to like notice that it's not a continuously varying thing, it is for all intents and purposes analog because that's how reality appears to us. So there's the new myth. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in another hundred years, there might be scientific discoveries that completely invalidate like all of quantum physics, and we're just like, oh yeah, we're back to a continuum. It's all fields, actually. There are no particles ever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that sort of 
my attempt to sort of uh, 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 do away with some of the old myths, add some new mythology to the idea of analog and digital, and offer people some sort of interesting ways to experiment with these ideas uh, in their artistic worlds. So thanks a lot for listening, and stick around because uh, depending on how long this is, I'll be doing a little bit of a Q&A after this. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone at Foo Bar for putting this together, and have fun.